You know what I love? <clears throat> I love, I love the mysteries of God. He doesn't tell us everything, does he? I love the mysteries of God because everything he doesn't tell us is really good. It's really good. The sound's kind of echoing a little bit. Um, if y'all want to work on that, I don't know. Can y'all hear okay? It's kind of echoing up here a little bit. <clears throat> I love the mysteries of God. And you know what I love about Jared? He and I, we've got this little texting thing going and he'll send me a, he'll, yeah, come on up. He'll send me a text and he'll say, uh, what do you think about this? What about this? And we, we share these revelations that we get and we talk through them together. And I want to talk about one today. I read this verse to start with last time and I want to just set it up again and then we'll, we'll get into it. But one of the great mysteries of God you ever heard of having a coming to Jesus meeting? <laughs> I think this was the first one right here. Jared, you might want to stay here because you may have to clean this theology up next week, okay? <clears throat> it was the third day, and Jesus walks out of the tomb, and there's Mary. Who are you looking for? I'm looking for Jesus. A few, more, a few more sentences, and then Jesus reveals that he is Jesus to Mary. You don't know what an incredible gift that was to mankind, to us as humans, that the first revelation of the resurrection of Jesus was to one of us. And I might say to a female, that's really cool. But then he said something interesting that's a mystery of God. He said, don't touch me. I haven't gone to my father yet. Have you thought about that? And then later in the day, he walks through the wall and into the room with the disciples. And he says, here's, here's my hands. Here's the holes in my hands. Touch me. Something happened between that time and that afternoon. And I'm just wondering, Jared, again, you might have to clean this up a little. I'm just wondering what happened between the time he said to Mary, he called her by her name which I think is the greatest word ever spoken in the human language because it revealed that he was who he said he was. Maybe the greatest word ever spoken was simply Mary. And then he ascended. He ascended into heaven. So what happened? I think there was a come to Jesus meeting. The original come to Jesus meeting, I think it was back in, in the chambers with the judge of judge, the God of the universe, the one that literally just spoke Lucifer into being one day. And I think there was a come to Jesus meeting between Jesus, God, and Lucifer. And I think he took that gavel out and he looked at his son who is still soaked with blood, had holes in his head and his hands and his feet, whose hair had been pulled out, whose beard had been pulled out, who spit on and he's standing there, resurrected Jesus. Come to Jesus meeting, you see. And I think he takes that gavel. And he's been waiting thousands of years for this moment. But it's been planned since the beginning of time. If you read the word, you understand this was going to happen. And he looks at Jesus and says, son, you win. He looks at Lucifer and says, you lose. Bam! And the gavel came down. And he said, here's what's going to happen. You had authority. You have no authority now. You have all authority now. And it all changed. It all changed. And I think he basically said to Lucifer, you can continue to lie. You can continue to spew lies. And, and we don't know one of the mysteries of God why he didn't just go, boom, you're out of here. There's something about that we don't know. But I think he said, you have no authority, you can tell your lies. And that's basically what he's been doing. Jesus, you have authority. And we're about to walk out to myriads and myriads of people. And it's all about to change. Because that authority was given to Jesus who passed it to you. And this is when it happened. 
They walked out of the chamber, I, possibly. Who is worthy of breaking the scroll? The seals off of the scroll. It's been sealed up ever since Satan basically had taken dominion through the fall of man. And him in unison, millions, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals as Jesus walked out into the crowd from the chambers. Because you were slain with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. You have made them to be kings and priests to serve God. And they will reign on the earth. Wow. That's a come to Jesus meeting. That was the original one. If you ever hear that again, I want your brain to go back and think about the possibility that this mystery, that's sort of what happened. And all of a sudden, there was a legal authority that was given to us, removed from Satan. And it's about you and I taking the legal authority as kings and priests on this earth and reigning. And not walking around going, look at this place. It's going to hell. We have no power. We have nothing to do. Let's go hide in our church somewhere and pray that somehow this rapture will come quicker than we thought. And God's saying, no, no, no. I gave you the power and the authority to rule and to reign and to get out of here and to get out there and make a difference. So what we're talking about, we started last week, was really, that's not a simple thing to do, but it's what we're called to do. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so we talked about taking heart last week. We talked about taking the, the mind that God has given us and the, and, the, and the spirit that he's given us. We talked about mental toughness. We talked about embracing the pressure. We talked about practicing for the emergencies, just like Jesus when he went and got tempted by the enemy. He basically quoted scripture and just put him in his spot. We talked about painting a masterpiece. Like Elisha's servant needed to see hope when the city was surrounded. And devastation was about to happen, he thought. And Elisha said, God, let him see the truth. And when he opened his eyes, there were myriads of 10,000 upon 10,000 chariots of fire on the hills and the mountains coming down, surrounding the enemy from the backside. That's the truth. The enemy wants you to think the truth is you ain't got a chance. The enemy wants to think you're insignificant. The enemy wants to think you've been taken out by some kind of trauma or tragedy. The enemy wants to wants to tell you that you, you, you are um, invalidated by something you did. And I think the further conversation back in that chamber was this, and it blew Satan away. And God said, you know what? Your lies might work for a little bit on someone, but you know what? There's this thing called forgiveness. And they can return to Jesus. They don't have to go kill a bird or a cow or burn incense or any of that stuff. They call on the name of Jesus and they're back in authority again. <laughs> can you imagine Satan going back in the camp and saying, guys, we lost authority, so we got to lie really well. Because not only can we lie to them and get them back, but you know what? They can be forgiven just like that. And the Bible says, as far as the east is the west, have I forgiven your sins. That's the world we live in. It's a pretty good world. Today, I want to finish. I got two more points to add to that. The first one is trust. I believe that God has put greatness into every human being in this room. The enemy lies to you and says, there's not. They said, I'm just, you know, you're just ordinary. You're insignificant. Nope. <laughs> God says you were created and formed amazingly for a purpose from the beginning of time. You need to hear that. The fourth principle is to trust in the God-given gifts and talents and callings that you've been given and to display them in such a way that you create greatness. I'm going to define that in a little bit. For the purpose of making the people around you eternally better. 
Back when I was a professor at the University of Kansas, a basketball coach, we had a good basketball program back then. He called and said, uh, he said, my lead shooter has gone into a slump. And um, he said, the problem is this. The number one team in the nation is coming in tomorrow night to play us. Two days later, we play the number two team in the nation in their stadium at Duke. <laughs> and four days, or maybe five days later, we come back and play the number four team in the nation in their stadium. And my guy shot two for 21 last week. <laughs> he's a 50% free throw shooter for life. And now in the last few weeks, he's down to 27%. We're losing the the. The newspaper, the school newspaper had the headlines that says, his name was Milt Newton. As goes Newton shooting, so go the Jayhawks. When he shoots 50%, we're 16 and 2. <laughs> We've lost five games in a row and he's shooting 27%. They're putting all the pressure on this kid who's a 50% shooter, one of the best athletes I've ever worked with, one of the greatest young men I've ever worked with. Amazing story. I wish he could be here and share the testimony and coach sends him to me. And I asked him, I said, so tell me about your life and what's a cool life. And I said, so what's your strength as a basketball player? And he says, well, I've always been a great shooter. You've always been a great shooter. When did you become a bad shooter? Two weeks ago. <laughs> you know, so he's 20 years old. Oh, okay, so all of this time you've been a really good shooter, and now you're not. So, so, so what's the issue? Have you lost your talent? <laughs> have, have you lost your ability to perform? Do you think it just left your body? Or do you think maybe there's some lies or there's some distractions? There's some interferences that have come in and taken and stolen it. He goes, yeah, I feel like I'm letting my team down. I'm letting my coach down. I'm letting this fans down. He said, I got a, you know, a, a, a handwritten note from a lady in western Kansas that tell me what I'm doing wrong. She says, I'm not waving at the basket when I'm shooting. She said, I'm waving sideways. He goes, I'm getting all kinds of advice. I'm getting all kinds of looks around campus. And you saw the headlines in the paper today. It's all about me. And I'm failing. And that's what he was thinking about. You think the enemy of lies. You, you see how he gets in our mind and he begins to take that gift and the talents that we've been given. It doesn't. I'm using basketball as an illustration, but whatever it is in your life. And maybe you haven't even found it yet. And that's what we get to do. We get to call out greatness in each other. We get to call out these great, amazing talents and gifts. We need to find that. We need to cultivate it. We need to go out in the world and display it so other people are inspired by the greatness that God has put in you. I said, Milt, we need to get back to where you were two weeks ago. And when you shot, what'd you think about? Nothing. <laughs> what are you thinking about now? I'm a failure. I'm letting the coach down. I'm letting the team down. I'm letting the fans down. We're losing. They're writing articles about me. People are telling me what's wrong with my shot. I've tried everything. I can't get it back. So you were thinking about nothing, and now you're thinking about all those things. So we're going to work really hard to get you back to thinking about nothing. Because when you were thinking about nothing, you know what that meant? That meant you were trusting. So you were trusting that talent and gift you gave. So I said, we're going to write a script. Just write it out about this game tonight. And I want you to use that word trust in every sentence. I trust my talent. I trust my abilities. When I look at the basket, I trust. I shoot, switch. I trust. I shoot, switch. I trust. I shoot. I miss. But I know this. When I miss, I'm a 50% shooter, so I must be due next time. And so we just built this script. It was a page long, and I took him down to the lab, and I said, I want you to read it with your lips. I want you to be able to hear this thing. And he read, he read it on there with some, with some emphasis, and we put some music behind it. I said, I want you to listen to this as many times as you can before the game, because I want the truth in your head to be louder than the interference that's out there in the world spewing lies. He goes to that game the next night. It gets the number one team in the nation, has 26 points, shoots 54% from the, from the, from the field. It's an amazing performance. The unfortunate thing, but it doesn't matter in this story, is that we lost in double overtime to the number one team in the nation. That's a victory, especially what's going on with him. He's back in it. He comes in the next morning. I said, how'd that feel? He said, it was awesome. He said, I hate losing, but it was awesome. 
I said, how many times did you listen to that? He said, I listened to it about 21 times. I said, so he's in class, you know, and he's got these earphones in. He's looking at the professor like he's paying attention, but he's just listening to himself all day long. <laughs> he says, Doc, you know this. We're going to Duke. We're playing in the hardest stadium in the country, and they're ranked number two. Can we make a script for that one? Yes, we can. We made a script for that one. He went, he, shot, he, he made 24 points and shot 52%. It was amazing. We lost in overtime again. But that's okay. One and two, we lost again. We make a script for the last seven games of the season. We start winning. We want all the rest of them. We're in a very hostile environment for our last game before going to the, the, um, the, the you know, the, it was back then, the Big 8 championship. We're in the most hostile stadium of the whole thing. He's sick. He's got the flu. He can barely get to the game. He gets there. He plays. He lays it all on the court. He's doing the best he can. He's shooting about 45% sick as a dog. And here's what happens. There's five seconds to go. We're down by two in the most hostile stadium in the country. Coach calls a play. They pass it in to someone else. They hit Milt at the top of the key. He fakes like he's going to shoot, and then he takes two dribbles. He's about to free throw line. His defensive guy's right next to him, and then he backs up. And as he's outside the three-point line, and the crowd's going, no, 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 he lets it go, swish. We win by one. Yes, everybody, yes. No, no, yes. That was cool. The next morning, he comes to my office. The greatest thing I ever heard, really, out of the lips of an athlete was this. I said, Milt, what were you thinking? He said, I was just playing basketball. Is that cool? Is that cool? You know what that meant? He had gone from interference to trust. He had gone from overthinking to just reacting and taking the gifts and talents that he had, and he was just playing the game. We overcomplicate things because of the lies that come in and the trash that comes into our head. In 1995, I was working with the women's volleyball team at Nebraska. I was speaking in Lincoln. Their coach heard me speak, and he comes and says, Hey, would you come work with our team? We've got a chance for the first time to win the national championship. Adrian, this is for you. So I did, and it was an amazing time. I loved that sport. It was just incredible. We... We spent the year together. As they went through the season, they go 34 and 1. There's one match left for the national championship. And it's against the University of Texas. I know there's some of you in here, but you know what? This is a good story. Go with me. (laughs) So he had told me, he said, I had a 21 year mission to bring in a national championship to Nebraska. He said, All of my colleague said, ain't going to happen in that icebox in the middle of the country. You need to go to California, to the east coast somewhere where volleyball is the king. It ain't going to happen there, but he believed it would happen. Did you know they had 92,000 people this year in the stadium, the football stadium, watching volleyball in in Nebraska? And it went back to this thing. Did you know there was never been a football game in that stadium that had 92,000 people watch a game? This guy was establishing something at this moment. That, that state went crazy for volleyball, and he had a belief that that could happen. You see, you've got to fight the lies. You've got to go with trust. It's 24 hours before the match, and I know there's a few perfectionists in this room, and that's a good thing up to a point, but you know what happens when, when you're a perfectionist and you've got a dream of your lifetime and time between the two. Your brain starts going crazy. It starts fritzing out. It starts thinking of all the issues that could be solved so that we could be successful. And the first thing our brain goes to is all of the negative things that need to be fixed. And you know what? We're not perfect. We're not robots. We're never going to be perfect. But you know what? By the grace of God, we can display our gifts and talents Way better than we normally do when we put our mind in it. I get, I'm, next time I preach, I'm going to talk about three verses in the Bible that trump everything Freud ever wrote. 
You think God cares about the mind? You ought to see all the verses in the Bible. All I did for 40 years was use the Bible as sports psychology. They didn't know it, the people I'm working with, but way more powerful than, than sports psychology. But that's for another time. So I get a phone call from Coach, and I hear this. David, I just don't think we're ready. They're 34 and 1. <laughs> so this will give you an idea that there's, a, there's, a, there's an imperfectionist on the other line. I just don't think we're ready. You see, I got four girls on the court that will be all Americans this year. Four out of six, all Americans. How many all Americans do they give in the whole nation? He got four of them. He said, I got another girl that will be next year, and she's on the court. So basically, what he's telling me is, I got five all Americans. And the sixth girl, her name's Kate. Kate, I'm worried about Kate. She's the weak link on the team. I think Texas is going to exploit her and we're going to lose the national championship match because of Kate. And in my head, I'm thinking, they could, they could put a, literally an elementary kid out there if they got five All-Americans. It, 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 it's not like that is going to make that big a difference. He says, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take her out. I'm going to put a freshman in. She's one of the best athletes we have. She doesn't actually play that position, this outside hitter. She doesn't actually play that position. She's done it some in, 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 in practice, but, but I'm going to put, I, I think I'm going to put her in. What do you think? <laughs> I'm seeing a red flag, another red flag, another red flag, another red flag. All right, her first start of her life is going to be a national championship match. She doesn't, this is an unfamiliar position pretty much for her. She's a freshman. She's got all your pressure and all the team's pressure on her, and she's never started. Let's see. There's a few flags going up. You guys would be great sports psychologists because you're right with me on this deal. <clears throat> and I said, okay, coach, here's what I'm thinking. I think that she's an amazing athlete. I do see what you're saying. She's going to become and did become an All-American three-time over. But <clears throat> I'm worried what the other five girls are going to think when you remove their teammate on game day, the most important day of their life. They're 34-1 and one with her, and you remove her. I'm wondering if you're sowing trust or doubt. You know, in my head, I'm thinking, are you the one that's creating lies or trust? That's what you get to do as a leader. That's what you get to do as a parent. That's what you get to do as a friend. That's what you get to do as a husband or wife. You get to, you get to sow trust, belief, greatness, truth, or you undermine with these other things. I said, what you might want to do, you see is go out on the court tomorrow and put your arm around Kate, look her in the eye and say, Kate, I trust you. I believe in you. All this stuff we've talked about this year, she, he, he, see, he, he thought she was unorthodox. She's kind of a right-brainer. He said she still jumps off the wrong foot. She's out of position a lot. She's an amazing athlete, but she just doesn't fit the box. About 50% of you don't fit the box that education has put us in. God bless you. I love right brainers. Wow. The world would be dull without us. So speak greatness into her life. Tell her to let it go. I said, I said, tell her that it, it's what everything you've done. It's all about this today. Have fun. Let it go, Kate. I believe in you. Just release your talent. He said, I'll think about it. <laughs> I said, don't stop with her. You got to go to Melissa and Christy and Lisa. You can say, just fill them full of greatness. That's your job. The hay's in the barn. He went out the next day, put his arm around Kate and says, Kate, I trust you. I believe in you. All that stuff we practice here. You know what? It's time just to let it go and just play. Let it go. Play. Have fun. I believe in you. You're so gifted. You're going to have a great, great match. <laughs> the match begins. Well, first of all, she was like a little dumbfounded because she hadn't heard that before from her coach. Her posture changed. Her demeanor changed. And the match begins and Texas comes right at her just like he thought. And here's what happened. She'd averaged 1.4 kills a game, about five or six per match she, at the end of her sophomore year at this point. 
in the national championship match against the University of Texas, she had 25 kills. She single-handedly annihilated Texas. She was named MVP of the match. She was named all-tournament team. She set an NCAA record that still stands today because a few years after that, they changed the scoring system, and so those old records still stand. The girl he was going to take out had the game of her life, the game of anyone's life. Celebration breaks loose out there on the court. It's crazy. The sea of reds down there, you know, it's already starting. <clears throat> and it's amazing, the celebration. And coach is wandering around, and he sees Kate sitting Finally, she just kind of sort of collapses on the bench, puts a towel over her head, and she's just sitting there thinking about what happened and just lost in tears and joy. And coach goes over there, and he kneels in front of her. He puts his hand under his chin, and he looks her in the eye and says, Kate, you were special today. No one's ever done what you just did. Tell me, what was the difference? And she stopped crying just long enough and looked her coach in the eye and said, Coach, it's the first time you trusted me. Coach, it's the first time you believed in me. I'm listening to him tell this story later, and he he reveals to me, he said it was like a ton of bricks hit him, that he realized that the words that come out of his mouth could literally change the destiny of a human being. Do you understand that? That the words that we speak over people, the words of greatness, fear, the words of greatness or defeat, have power. Because we've been given what? Authority. We've been called kings and priests. And the authority of those words, especially coming out of a believer's mouth, we've got to take the word seriously. And then he said this, and I realize as I look in the mirror every day and I speak words to myself, it can change my life, good or bad. What an amazing moment to experience. What an amazing story to share that a few words can literally unlock another person. This was a coach speaking to his athlete. What does the word of God say? Philippians. One of my favorite. (coughs) Philippians 4.3. We say this all the time, but in light of this story... What would happen if God spoke to you instead of a coach, which is powerful? What if it was literally the words of God in your prayer time? What if it was the words of God as you got up every morning? What if the word of God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Whoa, what if we took that? What if we took that as a literal word of God, huh? Isaiah says this, you will keep in perfect peace. That word is big time, man. We need to preach on that one a lot, Jared. Those whose mind are steadfast because they trust in you. Man, I love the word peace and steadfast because they trust in you. When Milt said, I was just playing. You know what he was basically saying biblically? I had peace. Jesus spoke, peace, peace be with you. To the storm, peace be still. The storms of our life, he gave us the authority now to do these things. Peace opens everything to you being able to distribute and give and use the gifts and talents that you have to be great. The fifth point, perseverance. You know, sometimes in life, and I've heard some stories in here, I know, there ain't nothing to do but this. I mean, 
The lies are thick. It doesn't look good. All the analysis is against us. All the stats say no way. I'm taking one step towards Jesus. I'm giving it all to you because you, God, you created the world. You're the one that spoke me into existence. You spoke creation into existence. I'm going to take a step believing that you can create something out of this mess. Last week, I told you the story about Scott Huffman, who um, eventually won the, uh, his first national outdoor championship, and then the second one, he jumped 19-7 the next year, and then he got injured and limped into the Olympic trials, and that was his last meet of his life. He had no chance after that, and he's still limping from this gruesome injury that he had, and it's like, oh, no, why me, why now on this day? And he ends up that day becoming an Olympian. I told you that story last week. This week, why Scott was injured, I want to tell you this story. Why Scott was injured in the, in the, in the, in the spring before the Olympic trials, his best friend, his training partner. They're both in professional track and field, but they're still working out at KU. With Coach loves having them there with all the young athletes. His name is Pat Manson. Pat was a 4.0 mechanical engineering student, first guy to show up at practice, last one to leave, most coachable individual I've ever witness in my life. Just an amazing young man. And he came to me about five weeks before the national indoor championship and he didn't have a smile on his face. He always has a smile on his face. And he sits down and said, Pat, man, you, you are just doing great. They had this thing in track and field called the Grand Prix series. So in each event, each individual event, whoever had the most points at the end of the indoor season is going to get a boatload of money. Pat was leading it. He was running away with it because he was finishing second, third, and fourth every time out. I said, Pat, man, you're having an awesome season. I'm so proud of you moving towards the Olympic trials and into the Olympic year. I know you want to be an Olympian. You're doing awesome. He says, I said, so why, why aren't you smiling? He said, I'll tell you why I'm not smiling. I got in this thing to win. I didn't get in this to finish second, third, and fourth. I know I'm racking up points, but I want to win. Scott knows how to win. I want to learn how to win. He said, I have some risk aversion. I don't know how good I can be because I've never let it go. (laughs) Anybody like that in here? I've never let it go. I've never extended it out there. I've never let it go. He was very conservative and he just hung on. You know what? (laughs) Sometimes as a coach, you just love that because at least he's consistent. But what if there's a superstar hanging out in there that's beyond anything we can imagine and the witness of that could just explode and influence so many people? Maybe that risk aversion needed to be broken. He said, I want to win, and five weeks from now is a national indoor championship, and I want to win that. Whatever it takes, I want to work on it with you. So each week we went through one of these principles that I taught you. And the fifth week was going to be perseverance. And I asked him to write each week a paper about it and how it's going to affect what he's about to do in the National Indoor Championship so that he's using everything that we have and know at the tip of the spear to win the National Indoor Championship. So it's the last week. We're going to meet up Wednesday at 10 o'clock. We're going to talk about perseverance. And on Tuesday before the meeting, he's practicing at 18 foot in the indoor stadium and his pole breaks his fiberglass pole breaks and the bottom of the pole shattered hit him right here and it goes in as far as it can and then it just falls his skull out the back i'm sorry you just need to know that's part of the deal right here he falls off of the the mats into you know the cement floor like this in a pool of blood ems comes in they put him on a stretcher because he's unconscious they don't know if he's broken his neck his back it looks bad. They take him to the local hospital there in Lawrence, Kansas, and he goes into shock. So they air vacuum him to the Kansas City Trauma Center. That's Tuesday. This was back before cell phones. That ages me a little bit. So I didn't know about this till the next morning. I'm teaching class at 9 o'clock. He and I are supposed to have a meeting at 10. Some of the athletes come in the class and they tell me, did you hear what happened to Pat? I go, no. No, I'm going to meet with him at 10. No, you aren't. He's in Kansas City in the ICU unit. He's had a horrible accident. No one really knows how bad it is yet. Wow. I'm going to end class early. I tell my assistant, 
cancel my appointments, I'm heading to the hospital, to ICU. And just before I walk out of the, the door, I get a knock on the door, and I go, she missed one. Here's, here comes somebody. And I open the door, and there's an unrecognizable individual with a turban of gauze around his head. His eyes are swollen, mostly shut, and his face is black and blue. It's pat, and he's smiling again. I go, oh, my gosh, what are you doing here? It's 10 o'clock. We have a meeting. <laughs> I said, no, I'm coming to ICU to see you. He said, well, I'm here. I said, are you okay? He goes, my head hurts. Can I have a seat? Yes, please, come in. Have a seat. I said, what happened? I don't know. I've had amnesia for the last 20 hours. He said, but, but uh, they say I had a concussion, no broken bones, and so here I am. And I said, what are you smiling about? He said, because I asked the doctor three questions. <laughs> What's that all about? He said, yeah, I asked the doctor three questions. I asked the doctor, what would you do? He said, I put 32 stitches and staples in your head. Oh, whoa, this guy's looking like Frankenstein. But I can't see it because there's gauze up there. He said, first question, Doc, will it come undone? <laughs> he said, no, I tied your head together with rope. It ain't coming undone. <laughs> oh, good. I'm, I'm, now I'm starting to hear something here. He said, number two, Doc, it hurts. When's the pain going away? He said, probably not for a while, but you can eat Advil. You can have as many Advil as you want, and they'll take the pain away because that's a legal drug for athletes. Great. Second question answered. Number three, Doc, I can't hardly see. My eyes are swollen shut. My face is big. When will the swelling end? He said, in about 24 hours, it'll go down. Thank you. Three questions answered. I go, what do you mean? He goes, here's what I'm going to do. I was going to fly tomorrow, but I'm going to change my flight to Friday. And I'm going to show up at the meet, and I'm going to come in when the bar gets really high. You can come in wherever you want in the vault. I'm going to wait till it gets about 18 foot. I'm going to come in and take just a few jumps, and I'm going to win the national indoor championship with 32 stitches and staples in my head. And I'm going to have a, he used the word, testimony (laughs) that this stuff works. And my first thought was, did we sign a waiver? (laughs) And I like speaking greatness over people, and I was hesitant, but I just let him talk because I knew his mother and his dad and the coach and the medical staff and the doctors, and on the other side of the medical staff, someone's going to talk sense into him. But he conned every one of them. And he went to the meet. He's got a hoodie on. He got the gauze off his head. He's got a hoodie on. He's sitting there loosening up. And the vault starts, and these guys begin to notice him over there. He hadn't even taken a jump since he broke his pole. And he's sitting over there. They come over and look at him and said, oh, my gosh, Pat, how you doing? Thanks for coming to support us. <laughs> I came to kick your tail is what he's thinking in his head. Finally, it gets to 18 foot. He goes to the vault director and says, I'm in. He said, you sure? Yes, sir. I'm in. All right, last in, first up. Pat Manson at the end of the runway takes his hoodie off, and there's Frankenstein. No hair, and there's a railroad right down here, and it's swollen and ugly, and it's got the railroad going really nicely there. And Pat gets at the end of the runway, the other has to go, what are you doing? Man, this guy's out of his mind. He can't do this. He says, get out of my way. I'm jumping. He takes that pole and goes, boom, and makes it 18 feet. One of the other guys misses, and now there's three of them left in the meet. They go to 18 fort. Pat Manson, you're first up. All of a sudden, the crowd in the stadium starts to move down towards the vault. They thought they were there at a track meet, and now they're, they're thinking there's a carnival going on down here. I've got to go see this thing. 18, four and a quarter. Pat Manson goes down. Boom, he makes it. First attempt. One of the other guys admits there's two. They go to 18, eight and a quarter. That's his personal record. His, 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 uh, stadium, it's his stadium record, and it's the meet record. Pat Manson, you're first up. He goes down and... Pops it on the first attempt. He makes 18, eight and a quarter. The other guy misses twice and barely gets over to the booze of the crowd because they were pro Frankenstein at this point. <laughs> they go to 18, 11, a new personal record for Pat, a new stadium record, a new meet record. And Pat takes it down there and he pops it. Four jumps, 18, 11 and a quarter. The other guy's feet never even got to the bar. Pat Manson wins the national indoor championship. 32 stitches and staples in his head. The worst adversity of his life to the greatest performance he ever had. How does that happen? 
You know what? We were supposed to talk about perseverance on Wednesday. We didn't because he was living it. He was literally living it. What does the Bible have to tell us about personality? I love James. Remember last week I told you the first words out of his mouth? He caught his breath, and then he came back to it again in verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those that love him. That's bigger than just the pole vaulting. That's life. Perseverance. It's part of reigning as a priest and a king in this earth where the lies are so loud. Those basically are the five tip of the spear points of performing by putting your mind in position to use the gifts and talents that God has given you to display what he has created you to do in such a way that other people are inspired and you get to speak greatness over them as well. And the last thing I want to say, and this is the end of the the, the cool story, is there's one more piece of this that's really important as a performer, and that's this. It's It's to understand this cool word that we don't use much anymore, and that is to pursue and have a noble heart. Pursue and have a noble heart. In other words, why do I want to take the gifts and talents that I have and be great? For the purpose of making those around you eternally better. By using the influence and the gifts that you have to influence others. A noble heart. Jared spoke about the seeds a few weeks ago, and this is the coolest verse. I'm just going to talk about the, the, third, the fourth and the fifth seed here. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, by riches, by pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble heart who hear the word they retain it and by persevering they produce a crop there's that word perseverance again here's the end of the story Pat and Scott brothers they they show up at the Olympic trial Scott's late because his bus broke down and his legs hurting and He's 30 minutes late. He comes in like, you know, crazy, but he sees Pat. And Pat looks like a deer in the headlights. And he goes over and says, Pat, what's wrong? What's up? And Pat said, I broke my pole on my first practice vault today. You broke your pole again? Yes. It didn't hit me in the head this time. But I went and looked at my other poles, and there's a tire tread across him. The baggage claim guy at the airport ran over my poles and compromised them all, and I'm out of the Olympic trials, the goal of his life. Unless there's someone else in this meet that weighs the same amount as me. He told me this before he saw Scott, or this story came up before he saw Scott, that weighs the same amount, that has the same poles, and that would be willing on the day of their life to share the pole with someone that tapes them differently and goops them up differently for the vault and they'd be jumping right after each other. There's only one person in the meeting, it would be Scott. So he tells Scott, I broke my pole and I'm out. Why are you out? I don't have any poles. They've all been compromised. Unless he sheepishly said, I can borrow your pole. This is Scott's last meet of his life. It's the meet that allows him to reach his ultimate dream. He would be allowing someone to come in and create interference with the way the poles wrapped and gooped and all that stuff, and they jump right behind each other. At the most important meet of his life that he's dreamed about for his life, and Scott said, yes, 
you can borrow my pole. There was something greater. Listen to this. There was something greater than becoming an Olympian to Scott. And that was brotherhood. That was the love of his friend. That says, on the most important day of my life, with the biggest goal of my life staring me in the face, I'm willing to give it all up and add that interference because I want you to have that same opportunity. Now you tell me, is that the definition of noble? Two hours later, the Olympic announcer comes on the Olympic uh, stadium where they're having the Olympic trials. They're going to have the Olympics there later. If we can have your attention down in the vault, Pat Manson, his last attempt. If he makes this attempt, he's the next, he's the final Olympian on the vault team. If he misses it, Scott Huffman will be the Olympian. It comes down to the vault. And no one there but Scott and Pat know that Pat's on Scott's pole. And Pat makes a great jump and he barely touches it with his t-shirt and it falls off. And Scott became the Olympian that day. And as I look at that story and I look at that year and all these stories I told you about Scott and Pat, that was amazing. A noble heart. I want to perform great. I want to be great so that I can make those around me better. Eternally better. Even to the point I'll let someone borrow my pole. The greatest, most important day of my life. And Jesus said, the crowd screaming, worthy is a lamb who was slain. Who retains or regains the authority And gives it to you as kings and priests so that you would reign and rule in this world. And the question is, can you find, will you receive the gifts and talents that God has given you? And display them in some exceptional way for the purpose of influence in the world for Jesus. By making the lives of others eternally better. By leading them to the lamb who was slain. Would you let someone borrow your pole? In that situation. Amen and amen. God bless. Thanks, Jared. Jared.